Uh, we're going to wrap up uh, 1 John with our first few minutes this morning, and then we're going to plow into 2 John. And before we do that, let's start with a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you again for another opportunity to gather together as your people to worship you uh, in song and and to study from your word. And we uh, pray that you be with us this hour as we continue it in our study of, of John's epistles. Pray that you'll continue to help us to apply these things to our lives as we go forward to, to be obedient, as John calls on us to do, to, to love each other and to, to hold fast to our, our faith in you and your son. It's in your son's name we pray. Amen. All right, so we are going to wrap up uh, 1 John here. Um, I know we kind of had to go through some things quickly, um, and I'm not going to talk too much about these last couple of verses, but uh, let's uh, re- pick up in verse um, 18 and finish the, the chapter there. In uh, 1 John chapter 5, we know that no one who has been born of God sins, but he who has been born of God keeps him and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are of God and that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Christ Jesus. This is the true God and eternal life. Little children, guard yourselves from idols. So John touches on a couple things he's been talking about here throughout the letter. He again is is going back to kind of comparing uh, the child of God, the the Christian, the true believer, and the uh, you know these people who do not truly know God. As we talked about at the very beginning, we can know God especially through Jesus, His Son, and so we have, of course, uh, references to Him here. I want to talk as as we wrap up here about this last verse, though this ending. Um, what do you what do you think about this ending? Is it a normal ending? Is it in like you expect? Expect? What do you think? Kind of a, an abrupt ending, I think. Uh, it's a little strange. Um, maybe it's not surprising that there's not like a, a some grand send off or greeting at the end because. You know, John doesn't really start with that. That's not really his style, so maybe that's not surprising. But it's almost just kind of, by the way, uh, guard yourselves from idols. Any, any thoughts as to why he would end with that statement? Absolutely, yes. Um, I, literal idol worship is still very much a thing at this time in, in the culture there. Anybody remember what area John seems to spend his last years? What was that? Yes, it, but also Ephesus. That's where he spends a lot of his time, it's, it's believed, uh, just from historical uh, context. And so there was a lot of idol worship in Ephesus, so that's part of it, but also just from a spiritual standpoint. I mean, whether we have a, a physical idol or not, we tend to have our idols. Uh, Mr. Champ, you had a hand. You have something? Yeah, I mean, we, we don't necessarily see people bowing down to idols as much anymore, but we, we certainly have our idols, and I would say idolatry is just as bad now as it, as it has ever been. Um, your idol may be different than mine, but we're all susceptible to putting something else in place of God and focusing on something else in place of God. Uh, and so if you think about all the things uh, John has been talking about here, focusing us on, on Jesus on the Father, focusing us on obedience. Um, it makes sense that I think he would kind of throw this in here, even if it is kind of an abrupt uh, ending there. Um, so uh, as we finish up here, I just want to do a little bit of review before we move into um, Second John. 
Um, there's a lot of things that I think John tells us about the nature of God in this letter. Remember, there were these kind of short, succinct statements that are very simple statements. We tend to try to struggle to define who God is. John does it very simply. One of the first ones he says is, is God is light there in verse 5. And so it's interesting to see how God is defined in this, in this letter and then how the, the Christian, the child of God is defined and how they are to be. So, of course, because God is light, the Christian is to what? Walk in the light. Uh, there in chapter one, he talks about that. What else do we learn? We learn that um, Jesus is our advocate. He's not just an advocate because we talked about how, you know, an attorney, I, I, I gave the example, if, if I represent somebody at trial in a criminal case, you know, if they are convicted, they're found guilty, I'm going home and sleeping in my bed. I'm not paying that penalty. Um, I'm just an advocate. Jesus is an advocate, but he's more than that. He's the propitiation. He paid the penalty for us, for our sins. Um, and so we see that our sin is, is cleansed by his blood. Um, what else do we see? We see that God is righteous. And of course, we as Christians must be righteous. Um, one of the big topics that John talks about here is righteousness and being righteous. The, the Gnostics, these people that were trying to draw people away, didn't really think that uh, the righteous character, the moral character that was taught by Jesus and the apostles was, was really that necessary. It was more about just having this special insight or special knowledge. Um, but John tells us God is righteous and we must also be righteous. Another big theme, love. What does John tell us? God is love. And so we must love one another uh, as his people. So we talk about the love of God um, for his people, the love we should have for God. And how do we demonstrate love for God? Yeah, keeping his commandments. That's right. Um, but we're not supposed to just love anything and everything. We're told not to love the world there in chapter 2. Um, and then the, our other big thing here that John is tackling is this notion that Jesus was the Messiah that was promised. He was the Son of God. He was God come in the flesh. That was one of the other big things that the Gnostics were teaching is that uh, there were kind of two forms. One, either Jesus was, was a man but was not God or Jesus was God but he was not really man. But that's not what we find in John's letter in John's gospel. He starts at the very beginning of his gospel, remember, that uh, the Word was God and the Word became flesh. Um, so if we uh, think about these big points, that, that Jesus is the Son of God, God in the flesh, um, how did John know that? Where did he start the, at the start of this letter? What did he talk about? How did he establish his credibility with his readers? points out that he's an eyewitness. What we have heard, what we've seen, what we've touched with our hands, this is what we now proclaim to you. This is not some fable. This is what we saw and heard and saw that Jesus um, did. And so he shares that with us so that we could have fellowship with God. Um, and so ultimately, remember these three big things we talked about over and over again and that John keeps repeating, that we need to um, live righteously. We need to love God by keeping his commandments. We need to love each other and we need to believe in Jesus and remain faithful to him. And so the ultimate result of that, John assures us there in chapter 5, in verse 13, these things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God so that you may know that you have eternal life. That's the ultimate purpose in writing there, so that he can assure these Christians who are going through this division, this, these challenges, that they have eternal life and remind them of that. Any uh, thoughts or questions about First John before we move on? Yes, ma'am. Right. Yeah, that's one of the most important things John points out about Jesus and what he did. Anything else? All right, well, let's move on to uh, 2 John. 
All right. Thankfully, since we only have the rest of this class and two more, 2 John and 3 John are much, much, much shorter. In fact, 2 and 3 John um, are, the, I believe, the short, two shortest um, books or letters uh, in the New Testament. Um, they're even shorter than Philemon and Jude, which are also both just one chapter only. Um, and these are actually, if you uh, look at the Greek, I think in the English, uh, either 2nd or 3rd John are a little over 300 words, but in the original Greek language, they're less than, than 300 words. So if you think about those essays you had to write back in school, a lot of those were supposed to be 300 words, give or take, so it's about like that. Um, and, and this is a lot closer, when we compare it to 1st John, to a, a typical letter that would have been written in this time, and even a typical letter written now. It's got a greeting, it's got a greeting at the, at the start, it's got a greeting at the end. Um, it, it just reads more like kind of a personal letter, whereas First John, to me, I think, is just kind of more like an essay or a treatise, and of course it's much longer than Second and Third John. Um, they would have more than likely been written on a single sheet of papyrus, which was normal for a letter back in that day, uh, given the length here. And so because it's shorter and it's a little less complex than 1 John, it's a little easier for us to, to give a, a, a general outline of it. It's very hard to outline 1 John, I think. Um, but here, uh, very simply, we can think of it as, as an introduction in the first three verses. Then the, the real meat of the message uh, in the letter of 2 John is in verses uh, 4 through 11. And we'll talk about the substance of that. Um, and then he actually, unlike the first letter, has a, a conclusion and a final greeting uh, there in the last couple of verses. Um, what I'd like to do uh, is, is just read the entire letter. And as I read through this, I want you to think about what are some similarities between this and what we learned and read in First John. And I'm going to ask you to give me some similarities. What are some things that sound familiar from what we've been studying these past several weeks? So uh, read with me in uh, 2 John, verse 1. The elder to the chosen lady and her children, whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all who know the truth, because of the truth which remains in us, will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace will be with us from God the Father and from Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. I was overjoyed to find some of your children walking in truth just as we have received a commandment to do from the Father. Now I ask you, lady, not as though I were writing to you a new commandment, but the one which we have from the beginning, that we love one another. And this is love, that we walk according to his commandments. This is the commandment, just as you have heard from the beginning, that you are to walk in it. For many deceivers have gone out into the world, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. This is the deceiver in the Antichrist. Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Anyone who goes too far and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God. The one who remains in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching, do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. Though I have many things to write to you, I do not want to do so with paper and ink. But I hope to come to you and speak face to face so that your joy may be made complete. The children of your chosen sister greet you. And so not often that we can read an entire book in just a few minutes in one class setting. But we're able to do that given the short uh, letter here. So... Having listened to that, maybe you read it beforehand to prepare, but uh, listening to that, what are some similarities? What stands out to you that reminds you of some things in First John? Yes, sir. In the beginning, that was, yeah, right. Yeah, we see a lot of phrases repeated. Um, John goes, you know, talks about from the beginning, what they heard from the beginning. We see that here as well. Yes, sir. Abide in the truth, okay, we talk, yep, yep, yeah, yeah, abiding or remaining uh, in faith or in the truth are, are two things that are talked about uh, in both letters, what else, 
Be aware of false doctrine. All right. So we see a, a reference to these false teachers. There, there seems to be a reference to the same division, the same problem that was talked about in First John. He, t- he talks about uh, there um, in verse 7, for many deceivers have gone out into the world. That's the same thing that John says in First John. Uh, it doesn't seem that there are people from outside the church that infiltrated within. It seems like there were people within the church that kind of led people out, and now they've gone out into the world. Um, what is said here about what they, the problem is? What are they saying or not saying? Deceivers. What does he also call them? Antichrist. So we, we saw that back in First John. It says... Um, Uh, In verse 7, those who do not acknowledge Jesus Christ is coming in the flesh. That was one of the big things. That was was how John defines an antichrist back in 1 John. So we see that uh, same problem here. So uh, because especially of of that inclusion, a lot of people think that these two letters um, maybe were written to different groups, but were probably written around the same time. And and this would have been a problem that may have been in multiple churches. Um, And so we, we tend to think these two letters were either written at the same time or very close in time. What else? Anything else stand out to you? Love one another. How many times did we read something to that effect in First John? Over and over, right? So John picks up right where he left off there in verse 5. Uh, what we had from the beginning that we love uh, one another. Anything else? You guys have picked up on a lot of it. We, we see um, John mentioning that he does not uh, write a new commandment, but one that was from the beginning. Uh, He says that same thing. I'm not telling you anything new. This is what you already know, what you should know, but and you should be doing. Um, So we see a lot of similarities. We're going to go through some of them. We're not going to go verse by verse here just for sake of time, but I want to kind of focus on a few big uh, things here um, that we see in the letter. Um, But let's, let's look at this intro first. So the intro is very different. Um, John actually identifies himself not by name, uh, but as the elder. John's gospel in 1 John, there's no introduction. John identifies himself towards the end of the gospel of John. uh, But he actually identifies himself in a way that would have told the reader who they're they're reading from, who this is about. And so he refers to himself as the elder rather than using his name. Um, There's a couple of different theories people have or, uh, you know, options, I think, for how we can take that. What do you think those might be as far as what, what does the elder mean? Yeah, those are kind of the two, two possibilities. I mean, he could be identifying himself as an elder, and that, that wouldn't be unreasonable to think. I mean, Peter identifies himself as an elder um, in First Peter um, chapter 5. Um, and refers to other elders. So it could be that John is is using that title in an official way, identifying himself as an elder. Um, Not that he's the elder above all elders and he's the one elder, but he is a elder. Um, But then the other option is is that he's just identifying himself. And I think it's likely he was probably known by this name and people would read the elder. Oh, that's John. All right. And so John could be referring to just his advanced age. He's believed to be in his 90s or so at this time. Uh, and we talked about how he's the last of the, the apostles at this point. You know, he, he's believed to have outlasted even Peter and Paul by 30 years. So that, just think about how that really gives significance. Again, we talked about this with First John, how significant it is to read the words of the last of the apostles, the, one of Jesus' closest apostles, one of the, that inner circle and so it's been some time since they've gotten writings from other apostles, and here they are uh, receiving one of these last letters from John. Um, but in either case, the, the name certainly identifies John's age, his authority, his relation to his audience. We saw him referring to the, the reader as little children a lot in First John. Uh, and so he identifies himself as the elder. And then it's written to... The, the chosen lady or the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth. Um, there's two different ways people have, have determined what, what this is about. Some believe it's written to an individual woman, a, a lady. Um, you can understand why that would 
be the conclusion for some because it does say lady singular and her children. Um, and so a lot of people that believe that and there's some historical tradition that says that it's written to Martha. Okay. Um, you remember Martha from, from Jesus life. Um, and that in verse 13, when he says the children of your chosen sister greet you, that that's a reference to Mary. Um, I, you know, I think that would just be kind of speculation. There's not really any reason for us to know that for certain. Um, the other option that aside from it being written to an individual person is that it's written to a church or a group of Christians uh, and that John is just speaking metaphorically uh, when talking about um, the church. We, we see, you know, uh, Paul writing about the church metaphorically, about the, the being the bride of Christ and things like that. And so he's writing to a church. And, and I think this makes sense to me because if you just read the letter, it, it doesn't really fit if it's to an individual. I mean, it, it reads a lot like what John is writing to, writing in 1 John, where he's instructing a group of people. It, it just seems to make sense to me more if this is written to a church or a group of Christians to a collective body rather than one individual. Um, I can't tell you 100% one way or the other, but that's just kind of where I've ended up on the issue. Um, any questions or thoughts about any of that? Okay. All right. So let's move on then um, to what I think are some uh, slide on your similarities. Um, let's move on to what I think are some big topics talked about here. Um, there's you know more than just this, but because we don't have a lot of time, I just want to pick pick out a few things rather than just going through it simply verse by verse. So if you paid close attention in the first few verses, you saw two words coming up several times. What were those? Truth and love. All right, slide gives you a hint. Um, truth and love. As we saw in First John, these are two things that are very important. Truth and love. Um, love is used four times here in this letter and really in the first uh, five verses, I think. Truth is used um, five times here in these first few verses. Um, but notice how, remember with First John, how John really connected obedience and love and faith. They were all intertwined. That, that You can't have love without obedience. You can't have faith without obedience. You can't either of those without faith. They're all connected. And notice how John intertwines um, truth and love. He says, the elder to the chosen lady and her children whom I love in truth. All right. Um, the two are connected. And you can't separate love and truth. When we think about Christian love and how it's portrayed and treated in the world, I think it's been misunderstood and abused. Uh, in a lot of ways. Um, and I think that's in part because people tend to uh, set, try to separate love from truth. All right. Um, you know, in, in the world and even in some Christian circles, uh, you see the, that the idea that loving someone means you have to accept them for who they are. You have to accept whatever lifestyle choices they've made, how they choose to live their life. You can't judge them. Um, you have to accept their faults. You can't condemn them. You have to tolerate whoever they are. That's what it means to love someone, right? And so people who, you know, non-Christians especially who want to, you know, poke holes in, in Christians will say, you know, well, if you're rejecting my lifestyle, well, that's not very loving. And Christ told us to, to love each other. So, you know, that's the problem with you Christians, right? There, there, there's a separation uh, between um, love and, and truth. Anybody agree with that? Have you seen that? What do you, what do you think about that? Am I off base here? Right. Yeah. I, I thought I heard it. Yeah, so, so people will, will invoke the name of Jesus to, to beat Christians over the head and say, well, you, you have to accept me, you have to tolerate me, you have to tolerate this belief system, this lifestyle, this, this uh, you know, sexual orientation. Um, and that's where you end up when you separate truth and, and love. 
And that's how people often try to challenge, uh, um, say that. They would say that to challenge someone on how they live their life is, is unloving. And that's simply not the case. Yes, ma'am. And John tells us here, how do we how do we demonstrate love by obeying his commandments? Yes, sir. Right. right. And you're exactly right. I mean, you know, pe- people um, try to think of Jesus in just that loving, caring manner, but Jesus was very confrontational in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and so I would say that true love can be confrontational. Uh, holding each other accountable, holding each other to the truth is, is true love. And when we do not give people the truth, that's not love. I mean, if, if you were to think about a doctor who received test reports on, on a patient that showed that they had cancer and they had a month to live, and instead of telling them that, they said, you know, they just didn't tell them because they loved them and they, they didn't want to destroy them and crush their spirit, so they just didn't tell them about it. They said, yeah, you're sick, but you're going to get better. You just got to do it. That's not loving, avoiding telling them the truth. That's some, something that they desperately need to know uh, about themselves. And so if you think about someone who's living in sin or living in a way that's going to lead them to hell, it's the same thing. If we're not sharing the truth, then that, that's not love. And we don't want to upset people. You know, I, I get it. It's, it's hard to share the truth sometimes, but, but true love uh, is love in, in truth. Um, but in the same way, um, you, you can't separate truth from love. You can't separate love from truth, right? So there's, there's certainly a, a loving way to go about this. I mean, I, I don't think, you know, because we've got a love in the truth, that doesn't mean we need to go around just, you know, grabbing people by the scruff of their neck and, and condemning people at every opportunity. There's a loving way to do that. Um, but the two go hand in hand. Uh, love and truth. They're grabbing them by the scruff of their neck, and that and that and that is a legitimate way to do that. It, it depends, I, but I think if that's our default with every person we run into, um, I don't know how effective that's going to be in, in sharing the truth and sharing love. But sometimes it may be necessary. I think you're right. Um, all right. So this next uh, idea here I want to talk about is this this thought about being watchful. Um, so in verse 7, John again identifies these deceivers, these antichrists. Verse 80 says, Watch yourselves that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you may receive a full reward. Remember, what was the, the ultimate thing John wanted to remind them of in 1 uh, John? Wanted to assure them of salvation, eternal life, right? So uh, John is telling them, watch yourself that you do not lose what we have accomplished, but that you, so that you may receive a full reward, that eternal life. Why do they need to be watchful? Because there are these deceivers. There's these antichrists uh, that are among them that have gone out into the world. So he, he, he's telling, these are people who have seemingly gotten past that division, that have stayed strong, stayed faithful, and so the answer to that is not to just, okay, now we can rest on our laurels, we can be complacent. No, the, the response is to be watchful, be vigilant. And so he tells them to, to watch themselves, uh, verse 9, anyone who goes too far and does not remain in the teaching of Christ does not have God, 
the one who remains in the teaching. That, that word remain, we saw again and again in 1 John, especially chapter 2. We've got to be watchful. We've got to remain uh, faithful. Um, this idea of being watchful, being on the alert, I think we see in a lot of places in the New Testament. I mean, if you think, and I think that's a great analogy, a good illustration for us, the idea of being watchful or alert. What are some ways in life, not, not necessarily spiritually speaking, but what are some ways that we are watchful? What do, what do we have to watch out for in life? Well, Okay, so, you know, somebody comes to your front door wanting to sell you something, you've got to be a little discerning, right? Yeah. What about, what about uh, parents? What do parents have to be watchful for? Their children, absolutely. Uh, you know, if you're not watching your children, that's usually when things go wrong. I mean, how, how quickly can a young child be 100 yards away? Um, very very That's right. Yeah, different way of thinking about watching, but that's, that's certainly true. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. What about our homes? We, we keep an eye on our homes. Uh, a lot of times if we're not able to watch, if we're not at home or when we're asleep, what do we, what do we have put in place? Alarm systems, right? Um, we keep an eye on our, fan, of our finances. We're watchful over our money to see where it's going, make sure nobody's stealing our credit card information. We have to be watchful in life. And even more so, we have to be watchful um, over our spiritual well-being. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 16, 13, be on the alert, stand firm in the faith. Basically what, what John's saying here too. Uh, Peter, first five, uh, Peter, first, first Peter chapter five, verse eight. Peter writes, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Why? Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Uh, it, you want to do a really interesting study um, uh, of how quickly someone who's very strong in faith, as maybe some of these people John was writing to, how someone very strong in faith and very assured in their faith can very quickly fall into sin and temptation. Look at some, whenever you have time, Mark chapter 14. Mark chapter 14. Remember, this is, this is right before uh, the, the crucifixion, right before Jesus' arrest. And Jesus is telling his apostles that they're all going to fall away. They're all going to scatter. And you remember who speaks up and says, there is no way. The, Peter. Now, Peter says, even if everybody else falls away, I'm not going to fall away. And, and remember what Jesus says in response? You're going to deny me three times. That's what's going to happen. And Peter says, no way, I will die before I do that. And so right after that, they go to the Garden of Gethsemane. And you remember what Jesus tells them to do while they're in the garden? Pray. He he says to them, remain here and keep watch. What does he, of course, come back and find them doing? Sleeping. All right. So he goes to them and says, keep watching and praying so that you will not come into temptation. Not so that we can be ready when the people come to arrest me, so that you do not come into temptation. The problem wasn't that he was drowsy, that he was going to fall asleep. The the problem was, is that Peter was not being watchful over his soul. And so, of course, what happens, Jesus is arrested and Peter denies Jesus three times. How does somebody go from saying, I will die for you to I don't even know who you are in a few hours by not being watchful? And so in just one careless moment, we can do the same thing. We can fall into temptation just by not being watchful over our soul. Yes, ma'am. No. Yeah. Right. And he runs away, away weeping. But, but that's what happens when we're not watchful. And so John, of course, encourages us uh, to watch out. How do we remain in that eternal life? Remain in faith by being watchful. Any other comments on that? All right. So then uh, in verse 10, John uh, connects this to to something kind of interesting. Again, we're in the context of these uh, false teachers, these deceivers um, who are trying to lead people astray, who have already led some astray. And he says in verse 10, If anyone comes to you and does not bring this teaching... 
Do not receive him into your house and do not give him a greeting. For the one who gives him a greeting participates in his evil deeds. All right. So uh, interestingly, um, John kind of connects this problem to hospitality. All right. And if we think about, um, you know, one of the, you know, the big things that's talked about in First John, loving our brother, fellowship with one another, part of that's hospitality, right? We can look in a lot of different places to see where we as Christians are, are told to be hospitable. But is, is John telling us to be hospitable here? No, he's, he's what instead? He's, he's given us an example of when not to be hospitable, all right? And, and, and he's very specific. You're right. Uh, you know, if someone comes to you and does not bring this teaching that uh, Jesus uh, is, has come in the flesh, if someone's coming to you teaching these things that these antichrists are teaching, don't be hospitable. Show them the door. And, and it's important to think about the context here because what did uh, the assembly what did the body look like in terms of how they met um, back in this time? They're meeting in homes. So not receiving someone in your home, not being hospitable or versus being hospitable has a little bit of a different context than, than I think we would normally think of it because the church is met in homes, right? And if you think about it, you know, there were a lot of reasons for people to travel. They didn't have, you know, all kinds of hotels. There was no Airbnb in the first century. Uh, inns were um, much less common. In fact, it was oftentimes looked down upon to be, to be an innkeeper, okay? So Christians, especially when they traveled, they needed to stay in, in another Christian's home wherever they were going. So this was a, and actually a big issue, I think. Um, you know, the, the need to have other people in your home was, was very frequent. And so, of course, if you're receiving people in your home uh, and they're spreading this false doctrine, that could be uh, very dangerous. And so John is, is warning them against that. Um, so, what, I mean, how, how should we maybe apply this uh, in our current day and age in our, our lives? And I, to me, I think there's a distinction here. You know, I, I don't think John is, is saying to them, be un unhospitable to everyone who, who is an unbeliever. I don't really think that's what he's saying. I think he's being very specific, talking about these people who are antichrists, who are actively trying to lead others astray, um, kind of as they're deceitful. So they're, they're trying to, to put themselves on as a, as a, a teacher from God, but they're leading people away. So I, I don't think we should take this to mean that we need to not show hospitality or not greet though anybody who's not a Christian. I, I don't think that's the point here. I don't think that was the point back in that context because if they all of a sudden didn't associate with anyone who's not a Christian, what would be the result? It'd be them and that's it. There'd be no more Christians. Maybe some offspring, but that's it, right? So that, that's not the, the conclusion. Um, but we do have to be careful about what relations we have with ungodly people and how are they uh, uh, affecting us. But the concern is, is, is in the church, we need to be very careful about addressing false doctrine and not allowing it to infiltrate and to corrupt the body. 
And so I think that's kind of the ultimate point. That's why John's saying this, uh, is so that they will not have further problems with this down the road. Um, any other questions or thoughts about that? Yes, sir. Right, exactly. Yeah, this is not just, you know, the casual unbeliever that, that you know, you're trying to convert. This is someone who's trying to convert you and lead you uh, away. Somebody over here. Yeah, and that's sometimes necessary and kind of goes a little bit back to our discussion. I mean, we sometimes don't want to be confrontational. Um, it's not very loving to call someone out and, and do that, but, but love and, and truth go hand in hand, hand, in hand right? Um, all right, so uh, the last thing um, I wanted to point out here uh, in verse... Uh, go ahead. Yeah, and that, you know, kind of the same thing we talked about before. I mean, we may not accept someone's lifestyle. That doesn't mean they're not a soul that can, can be won, um, you know, but, but it's something that we can't just ignore and can't address. And so when it, especially when it becomes a matter of the, the health of the church and the health of the body, it's, it's something you got to get to the root of and, and pull it out. Um, just got a minute or so left before I don't want to jump into our last point. We'll save that for next week. But any other comments or questions? Yeah, it, it kind of gets to the, the idea in criminal law of aiding and abetting. You're the, the driver in a, in a robbery. You can be held just as liable as the person that went in and held the gun. Um, so kind of a, a similar concept. You, we certainly don't want to facilitate uh, any of this um, you know, false teaching, anything that's going to be a stumbling block or, or to lead someone away. All right, so we'll finish up uh, uh, Second John with our first few minutes next week and then get into Third John. Uh, so appreciate your comments and attention.